Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. Your word is life. Your word is strength. Your word is love. Your word is death. And we want to embrace everything your word has for us. Open our hearts to receive it. In Christ's name, amen. Today's Bible study is small. It's short. We're only going to study the, the uh, 13 verses that are in chapter 8, and it goes fast. But it must be laid out on a premise because you'll miss the whole point of the Bible study if I don't really give a big introduction for it. The point of the... Uh, The message that Paul the Apostle, who wrote the 8th chapter of the book of 1 Corinthians, is saying is it's of a mindset so different than most of us have ever expected. I'm going to tell you a couple of stories, and then we're going to look at a couple of scriptures. I remember my life being changed in three major ways. The first way was I was reading a story. I've said this to you guys before. I've mentioned this. I've repeated it. I've, I've probably beat this like a dead horse so badly that you guys, as soon as I start to tell you the story, you're like, oh, yeah, I know that story. But I, I'm, the reason I'm telling this is because when I heard it, it just was like, it was something I never could imagine. And this is, this is germane to what I'm uh, saying. Chuck Smith, the founder of Calvary Chapel, was looking out over the beach with his wife, Kay, and his wife said to him, Honey, look at those poor kids. This was Southern California in the 60s. It was the time of the hippie movement. Sex and drugs and rock and roll were the call of the day. And her, she was broken hearted because these kids were, most of them were homeless, messed up, disease ridden. They'd been lied to. This was the end of the the end of the 60s, and the fruit of their lives had come upon them. So they started inviting them to the church, and the craziest thing happened is these people started coming to church. Now, everybody knows when you're a drug-infested, sex-ridden, pervert, whatever, you don't go to church. It's not who church is for. Church is for perfect people like me. So when these, you do know that was a joke, right? (laughs) Okay, didn't get any laughs on that one. Thank you, Johnny. I just, I want to thank you for laughing. So what happened is these kids started coming off the beach and going into this church. And one of Chuck Smith's elders, now I, I make this clear that it's an elder of the church. It's somebody who's a part of the ministry. He comes to Chuck and he says, Chuck, these kids that you and Kay are inviting, look at what they're doing to our carpeting. There's sand from the beach all over the carpeting. And Chuck, without batting an eyelash, missing a beat, pausing a second, he said in his booming, deep southern voice, California southern, well, get rid of that carpet. We don't want these kids to feel bad at all. I remember hearing that story. It's like, you know, I was reading it, and I think, that is like the last thing I'm thinking. And I'm thinking, how do you solve the problem? You know, maybe we can get, um, I don't know, man, maybe we can get a separate building for them. I remember reading it and thinking to myself, what would I do if somebody came to me and said that? What if we had like a bunch of homeless people and they were tracking mud all over our floors and all that? The last thing I'm thinking is rip the carpet out because I don't want them to feel bad. But that is this radical way of thinking that the Lord Jesus thought. He thought others better than himself, not just in word, but in deed. Not just in um, in theory, but in sacrifice. Now, what does this mean to us? Some of us right now, you're like, yeah, 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 I know this, you know, the golden rule and all this stuff. Listen to me. You don't get this. And for some of you, especially you uh, only children out there, um, 
I don't beat nobody else up. <laughs> Just you only children. You're not going to wrap your head around this. I remember it was um, me and Tom, Ray Traver, and a couple of other guys, and we'd intermittently fast. We'd fast together for like a week at a time, and we'd get together at the end of the week, and, and we'd pray, and we'd, say, we'd tell each other what the Lord showed us. You know, six, seven, eight years old in the Lord is an amazing thing. It's just when you're on fire for the Lord and you're in that seven to ten year range, man, it's the greatest thing in the world. Discouragement hasn't set in yet. The sovereign hand of God hasn't had a chance to push back and you. You're just like, yes, I can do anything. It's amazing. You, can believe, you believe in prayer and fasting. And I remember um, there was a particular sin I wanted to overcome. And I thought if I would just overcome this sin, I'd be so close to God. It'd be like, he'd be like right there. So I, I, I prayed and we fasted and I had like freedom from this particular sin for a few months. And then we prayed for a week, me and Ray and, and Tom, and, and we got together and we started to pray. And I was so sure when I told them that I've, I've, I've got freedom from this sin, they were going to be like, oh, dude, what's it like? And I'd be telling them, could smell God's breath. It smells like heaven. It smells like manna. And that wasn't what happened at all. I climbed this mountain, and to get to the top of this mountain, I saw five mountains, larger, less able to climb, unattainable, unachievable. I had thought I was, listen, listen, I had thought my whole life, I've been with my wife now for 30 years. Our 25th wedding anniversary is coming up. We're over 30 years together. And if I could tell you that it was 15 years with her, and I swore, she's crazy. The crap that I have to deal with with this woman, what I have to put up with, like, I'm a saint. When I get to heaven, God's going to be like, Crown on my head, medal on my chest. Good job. I put up with my woman. And it was at this time. You relate? No, I was. Oh. Oh, you both can relate. I understand. If you guys knew their history, you'd understand too. The Lord said something to me during this time of fasting. You know what he said to me? He said, you're very moody. I'm not moody. She's moody. No, it's you. It's me. No, 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 no. no. Listen, she wakes up in a bad mood sometimes. I deal with it. She goes to bed and I deal with it. And the Lord showed me clearly, without a, listen, without even a hiccup, there was no mistaking, it was me. And I remember, listen, and it, we're laughing, ha, this is, this is real freaking funny, right? It wasn't funny at the time. At the time, it was like earth-shattering, moving, like, how could it be me? Do you know how many fights I've had with this woman? Do you know how sure I was that it was her? Do you have any idea how many times I've told my friends and family, oh, I can't, I can't roll this. I, I, because I can't change. I was absolutely positive I couldn't change. I've planted my flag on this hill for so many years. Do you understand? This was me. Stubborn, strong, and absolutely, 100%, unequivocally right. Now, I didn't know how this was going to change. The worst of it was not that I realized that I was wrong. 
the worst of it was that I didn't know how I was going to change. Like this sin that I had just overcome, it seemed minuscule, like a small mountain standing out at this Alps. If you would please turn to Matthew chapter 18. I want to, keeping your place in 1 Corinthians, obviously, because we haven't read there yet, but I want to show you how we won't be the first group of people to have this revelation, this truly, guys, if you are willing, if you are willing, you today will have what is called an epiphany. If you do not know what an epiphany is, that is something that God does that turns a light on, click, my epiphany was it was me. Some of you guys that are here, anywhere from, say, 19, 20, up through 25, some 30, your whole life, you never think about anything but yourself. You are so saturated with everything that is good for you. Everything is a manipulation. Every job, every relationship, it is always about what is good for you. And you even justify that very thought in and of itself to say, well, of course, who else am I going to think about? Well, according to Scripture, to think about other people above yourself is the true way to happiness. Well, maybe happy for them. No, happy for you. See, the way up is down, and the way down is up. You have to get to that place that says, the king is dead, long live the king. The king is dead, long live the king. Imagine the creator of everything. I want you to imagine that that creation rolled off his fingertips by the power of his word. He said, be. And existence happened. Time and space, the continuum of everything that is. He flung the stars into space, not with his hands, but with his words. Be. And yet that same creation put him on a cross and nailed him to it. And at any time, any point in time, he could have said, done, over with. This ends now. I will not watch what they do to my son. But he never did that. When you say things to your woman like, hey, don't you disrespect me, I'm a man. <laughs> Cute. God's in heaven saying, yeah, I know how you feel. Verse 1 of chapter 18, at that time the disciples came to Jesus saying, Who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And Jesus called a little child to him, set him in the midst of them, and said, Assuredly I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore whoever humbles himself as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whoever receives one little child like this, in my name receives me. Give me your attention. Hint one that there's something missing is I always thought that to come to Christ, to grow into the fullness of a man, I pay my own rent, I pay my own electricity. I remember realizing that paper towels cost money for the first time. You know, you make a spill in the house and you didn't pay for the paper towels and it's just <laughs> throw them in the garbage. My father would be like, are you kidding me? And he'd be in the garbage pulling these things out, and I'd be like, you cheap. Until my kids left a roll of paper towels outside, and it rained on them, and I'm laying out the paper towels, drying them out. <laughs> 
you kidding me? You know what my wife does that drives me crazy? And here's the crazy thing. My daughter does it also. Elena does it also. You guys know wipeys? They're about two fifty a pack, right? And you get like a big pack, right? They open the wipeys up. They take one, two, three. First of all, you don't need that many. Kids butts this big. <laughs> Roll them up, throw the diaper away. Are you leave? And they leave. I come by. I look at the wipeys. Not only are they open, they're dried out like the freaking desert. <laughs> I put water in them, a little alcohol, <laughs> close them up. I put, are you kidding me? Are you kidding? What? The thing clicks. It's not, don't tell me you didn't know. <laughs> it clicks. <laughs> Skip down to verse 15. So step one is realizing there's the problem. Step two is obedience to overcoming it. Here's step two. The Lord Jesus tells his apostles, his disciples, tells us a way to deal with problems that nobody does. You ready for this? Are you guys ready? I am about to change your life if you're willing to receive it. If you're willing to receive what I'm about to read to you today, what I'm about to show you, what I'm about to, yes, teach you today, will change your life forever. And in a good way. Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. All right. So, sister, brother, you're in church today. We got about 40 or 50 people here. Somebody in this church does you wrong. They do you dirty, man. You promised to do something they didn't do. They didn't say hello when you thought they should. Whatever it is that you are done wrong in. You made plans to get together. The wife didn't do this. You know, he looked at my husband. Whatever. You have been done wrong. The Lord Jesus says, listen, moreover, on that whole thing of changing the way you think and the way you act and the way you respond, you go to that person, you're ready, alone. Before you've put it on Facebook, before you've called friends and family to tell them how this is why you stopped going to that church, before you've created the scenario that you tell everybody your side of the story, so that way if they tell, they think they're lying. Because you've already set it up. You go to them one and say, hey, um, so why don't you know you did me wrong? Alone. Face to face. Not a text. Not an email. Not a snail mail. One on one. It's ridiculous. But if he will not hear, take with you one or two more that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So he says, if that person that did you wrong doesn't hear you, that's not your opportunity to hate them forever. That's not your opportunity then to put it on Instagram or Snapchat because we know that disappears. It's your then now to say, you know what, dude? You ain't going to hear this. Me and you made a deal. You're supposed to do some work for me. I gave you a deposit and show up. I'm going to grab a couple of brothers and we're going to go talk to them. Now, two or three, you go and you say, to this, hey, you, uh, you did... You did him wrong. Come on, man. Make this good before this gets out of hand. Now, I want you to know that I've been a part of church now for the better part of the last 25 years. Do you know how many times I've seen this happen? Probably one or two handfuls, tops. And every single time I've seen this happen, it's worked out great. God shows up. And the vast majority of the time, it works out great anyway. 
and so you don't have to do it. You know, you just forget about it. You write that person off. They leave the church. You leave the church. Whatever. It worked out fine. But you were disobedient. And you don't know what happens to their life after this is over. Maybe they now take this into their next lifestyle or whatever. Yeah, come back. I know that might be a little bit much right now. Verse 17. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses to hear even the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. So, somebody does you wrong, you confront them, they don't listen, you go back with another person or two, they don't listen, you go and tell the pastor. They don't even hear the pastor. It says you treat him like a heathen and a tax collector. And you know how you treat heathen and tax collectors, Right? You love them into the kingdom. Wait, no, that's when I get to hate them, right? That's when I get to slash their tires? That's when I get to put salt in their gas tank? That's when I sue them! This makes no sense whatsoever, except the fact that he who created you knows what's best for you, not you. You don't know what's best for you. You only think you know. Because at your age right now, spiritually speaking, maybe even physically speaking, you have completely determined that logic, the epicenter of your brain is telling you, I feel this, thus I do that. I've done this before, this is the outcome. You haven't yet reconciled nor surrendered the facts. And the fact is, you don't know what you're doing with your life. You just think you do. And you're torn up by fear, by worry, by doubt. Your relationships are all falling apart. Your life is a complete mess. And you're the only one that knows it. No. God's giving you today the answers for happiness, the reasons, the way out. not been called to live in fear. As Christians, we are so weak. We live with such a selfish, self-righteous, self-motivated thing. And the only way out of it is death. Our death. Who cares if you've been done wrong? Back to 1 Corinthians. Watch this. Verse 1, chapter 8, 1 Corinthians. Now concerning things offered to idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. Before we get to verse 2, he says, answering the questions that they asked, now concerning the things offered to idols, you have knowledge. And what he's about to explain is the difference between love and knowledge. Knowledge will lift you to a place. Listen, you know what I've taught my kids their whole lives? Watch this. Son, what's the two words you never say to a man? I know. You never look at another person and say, I know. Hey, you know, if you put that jacket on, you won't get wet in the rain. I know. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, all right. That's the appropriate answer. I know. You should take those two words out of your vocabulary. But what if I already know? <laughs> you feel as though that's your opportunity to tell somebody what you know? I know. Hey, would you uh, take that stack of papers and put them over there? That's where they go. I know. Hmm. You know a lot, huh? I know everything. I'm 15. <laughs> Keep your place here, please, and turn to Luke chapter 17. That's, again, a few pages to the left. Luke chapter 17. I told you it's extremely important to set up today's Bible study because I'm going to read through very quickly when we go back to 1 Corinthians. And unless you have a full introduction of what I'm talking about, you will not learn this lesson. 
Why are we now as a people suffering divorce in the 70% range? Even as Christians, why? Irreconcilable differences according to the courts? No. Selfish desires turn to sin. I ain't getting divorced. I ain't getting divorced. I'm not doing it. Then he said to the, to the disciples, it is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea that then he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourselves. If your brother sins against you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times a day returns saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. Please give me your attention before we read verse 5. I had a daughter. Oh, I, had, I still have a daughter. Her name is Ashlyn. Ashlyn was the one that you could wear out a whole draw of spoons on in a day. You're just, you'd be astonished that you'd go, I can't believe you did that again. I've got to spank you again. And you go and you'd hear that, I don't know, how, which one of you guys kept the spoons with the metal spoon? So they'd hear the drawer open and the kids would scatter just from the sound of the drawer opening because the, 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 uh, the utensils in the drawer all shake when you open it. But Ashlyn, she was amazing. She was always really sorry. And it was sincere. It wasn't, I'm sorry, okay? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Why did you do that? I don't know. I don't know why I do that. I don't know why I do that. It break your heart. You just have to beat this kid over and over again. I am sorry, Daddy. He tells his apostles, he tells his disciples, he tells us, if you have somebody who wrongs you seven times in a day, and every single time he wrongs you, he says, I'm sorry. I want you to forgive him. How ridiculous is this? How ridiculous is this in the, in the scope of a marriage? Do you understand? This is the only way you will survive. Do you know some of you women, you wake up every single morning thinking you have to offer your husband some grace for being the pig that he is. And every day it's a challenge for you not to be mad at him. Because he's given you so much over the last, I don't know, week. And you just cannot believe that he is so hard-headed, so thick skulled. You just don't get it, do you? And they're mad at you, and you are just like, I can't believe you're mad at me again. You can't believe I'm mad at you again. I can't believe that you didn't take the garbage out again. I can't believe that you didn't empty out the dryer again. I can't believe that you, whatever it is that you didn't do, whatever amazing crime that you've committed against humanity that certainly needs punishment. And that becomes your life. And as funny as it sounds when I'm saying it, some of you guys are like, I am so sick of this girl being mad at me all the time. This verse is for you, sister. Man, let it go. Let it go. He ain't doing drugs. He ain't cheating. He ain't smacking you around. He works? Listen, I got a whole lot of single sisters right now. They're listening to this list. They're like, can I meet him? He works doesn't watch porno, 
doesn't cheat, doesn't smack me around, doesn't do drugs. I want to meet him, I'll decide after that. Sisters, 70 times 7. You know what the response of the apostles was? It's probably the same as your response. Listen to this. And the apostles said to the Lord, increase our faith. Excuse me? Yeah, I need a fresh dose right now. <laughs> Increase our faith. And you know, I'm sure it was Peter who said it, because Peter's like, this dude sins against me three times. He's swimming with the fishes. I mean, Peter's the one that, like, when they came after the Lord, he took his sword out, and he's, like, cutting heads off. And the Lord, like, put his hand on the sword and said, Peter, Peter, put your sword away. Do you not think I can call my father and have ten legions of angels here? And Peter's just like, I just don't. What are you talking about? Isn't this what we do? We fight for what we believe in? Not this kingdom. Not this kingdom. So the Lord said, if you have the faith of a mustard seed, you can say to this mulberry tree, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea and it would obey you. And which of you having a servant plowing or tending sheep will say to him when he's coming to the field, come at once, sit down to eat, but he will not rather say to him, prepare something for my supper, gird yourself and serve me till I have eaten and drunk, and afterward you will eat and drink. Does he not thank that servant because he did the things that were commanded him? The Lord says, I think not. So likewise you, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we're unprofitable servants. We've done what was our duty to do. There's a mindset I've missed. I've missed. You ready? 25 years. Ready? Guys, it's our turn. 25 years of faithfulness. 25 years I have been faithful. I have worked hard. I've not done drugs. I've not cheated. I've not smacked around. 25 years. What have I earned? Nothing. You did what you were supposed to do. What, do you want a medal? Tell him what he's won, Bob. <laughs> a happy marriage. That's what your job is, dude. What do you think you're supposed to do? You stood before God and man. You said, I do, I will, rich or poor, sickness and health. What do you want? I don't get it, but don't we have like, do we earn anything at all? Dude, not on this earth. You are nothing on this earth. This earth is for you to spend your life serving others. In the next life, I don't know, maybe. But I tell you this. At 53, almost 54 years old, here's what I've learned. The more I serve myself, the more miserable I've become. The more I die, the more I let people step on me, walk around, pfft, Man. And I always revert. I, I, I'm doing business with this guy, and, and, and he says, hey, send me $2,500 deposit. I'm going to send you this big shipment. I send him $2,500. No shipment. Call him up. Dude, where's, oh, next week I'm going to, you know, week after that, oh, I'm going to refund your money. This guy's got $2,500 of my money. $2,500 $2, of my money. And you know where he is? He's in Georgia. He's in South Georgia. Man, I can be there in about eight hours. I could smash his skull, take his vehicle. I could... this, is the, this is where I come from. Excuse me? You took my things. I bled, I sweat, I earned. And I can't do that anymore. And it drives me crazy. Ryan, that's not what we do. Why? Because that's not who we are. So would we just let people step all over us? Yeah. And he just takes my money? Well, here's the thing. It's a great opportunity because that $2,500 could buy his salvation. Imagine if you say, hey, dude, I forgive you. You know what? Pay me when you can. 
As the Lord forgave me my sins, I'm going to forgive you yours. Excuse me? That's what you want me to say to do that stole my money? No, that's not what I want you to say. That's what the Lord wants you to say. I can't do this. Some of you guys right now are like, this is the stupidest Bible study I've ever heard. You're right. It is the stupidest Bible study you ever heard on earth. On heaven, the angels are like, preach it, brother. The angels are like, preach it, brother. You know why the angels, most of them, hate your guts? Do you know why they hate your guts? Because you're made lower than them and God loves you more than them. Isn't that crazy? The Bible says that you are made a little lower than the angel, but crowned with great glory. That the angels look at you and just in wonder and disgust. Those things? Those is what the Bible calls in Psalm, I want to say 16 or 18, one of the two, are the excellent ones on the earth in whom is all my delight. To whom of the angels has he ever said that, according to the book of Hebrews? That he loves us more than the angels. Insane. Insane. Back to 1 Corinthians, please. Now, concerning things offered to idols, we're rolling right through this Bible study. We know that all, we know that we all have knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love edifies. And if anyone thinks that he knows anything, he knows nothing yet as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, this one is known by him. Therefore, again, concerning the things, I'm sorry, concerning the eating of things offered to idols, we know that an idol is nothing in this world, and that there is no other God but one. For even if there are other so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we for him, and one the Lord Jesus Christ, through whom all things and through whom we live. Please, let me explain to you so that we understand. He says to them like this. He goes, listen, guys. You wrote me a letter asking me about things offered to idols. And let me explain that to you. In Corinth, there were all these sacrifices being made. There was animal sacrifices. There was temples. And in order to go to the market, you'd go to the market and, you, and they have this meat that's hanging there and you want to buy this meat or that meat or you want to buy that. And said, so, well, was that offered to an idol? Yes, it was. It comes from Temple Diana where they offer animal sacrifices. Yeah, I can't eat that. And they started writing Paul letter, but I don't understand. Should we eat these things sacrificed to idols? Should, what should we do because these kids keep putting dirt on our carpeting? Stay with this thought. It's so important. The Apostle Paul says, listen, there's no real other gods. There's only one God. But in the world, people have their idols, their gods, their lords. Some people worship this, some people worship that. There is no other so-called gods. For us, Christian, there's one God. The Father. And one Lord Jesus Christ. You follow me? What do we do with this knowledge now? Stay with me. This is where it gets a little bumpy. However, there is not in everyone that knowledge. For some with consciousness of the idol until now eat as it is offered to an idol. And their conscience, being weak, is defiled. He says, some people... You know, I go out with some friends sometimes, and they'll all order beers. Oh, you, you mind if I drink a beer? And they go, you can, you can drink diesel gas if you want. I, I, that's your business, buddy. And he goes, well, I don't want to offend you, and, and I know you can't drink a beer. And at that point, I usually reach over, grab his beer, take a mouthful, and put it down. Can we stop now? I'm a person. I choose not to drink beer. Beer has no power over me anymore. It used to. It doesn't anymore. You have to drink beer. I don't. 
I have the knowledge of this. Now, what I do with that knowledge is how I care or don't care about my brother. The whole Bible study, everything that I've, that I've laid out for you about death to self is purely coming down to this. What do you think about other people in relation to what you have the privilege, the right, or the freedom to do? Do you understand what I'm saying or not? You will. Watch what he says here. People are eating things offered to idols and it, and it bothers them. Verse 8, but food does not commend us to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, nor if we do not eat are we the worst. But beware, lest somehow this liberty of yours becomes a stumbling block in an idol's temple. I'm sorry, a stumbling block to those who are weak. For if anyone sees you who have knowledge eating in an idol's temple, will not the conscience of him who is weak be emboldened to eat these things offered to idols? And because of your knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. But when you thus sin against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat again. Never again eat meat, lest I make my brother stumble. Listen, this is so crazy. Paul says you should think so much about other people. He said the question wasn't whether you could eat meat offered to idols. You could eat anything you want. As a matter of fact, in another scripture he says, eat anything they put in front of you as long as you bless it first. He doesn't care what you eat. Eating doesn't make you closer to God, nor does not eating make you further away from God or vice versa. You know what really is important? If you ordered a beer at a restaurant in your freedom, did you consider maybe that the waitress might be a, an alcoholic and she's got to look at that beer as she puts it down on your table? Maybe she sees you pray? Oh, wait a second. Are you saying I have to worry about every single person? I'm saying there's a struggle there. If you're hanging out with some people, man, and they're vegans, I love making fun of vegans. I mean, that is just the easiest thing. To, that's like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, Jim Gavin has got this whole routine he does about it. He goes, you notice that vegans have all their food that looks like meat, but we don't have any of our food that looks like... Like, we don't make, like, a meat broccoli, but they make a veggie burger. So you, what you're saying, basically, is you really wish you had a burger, but you're going to make it out of vegetables so that you could feel like you're eating a burger. I got a better idea. Why don't you eat a burger? Oh, it's just so disgusting because it's just so, it's meat, you know, it was an animal that had eyebrows and everything. <laughs> Here, the Apostle Paul says, listen, you know what? If you care about that person at all, don't eat meat. It's like not eating meat is not going to make you closer to God, and not eating it is not going to make you further away from God. So, if I'm hanging out with some friends and, and the struggle is real, like they really are, you know, animal people, like they're PETA. Don't eat meat. Why would I do that? To win them over. This is the mindset of a true Christian. And this is what you think. This is why he says, you see, and it looked like it doesn't fit, but he says, Knowledge puffs up. You have this knowledge. What are you going to do with the knowledge? Listen, that's ridiculous. To think that an animal is on the same level as a person? Stupid. Animal is an animal. They're made for eating. Vegetable is a vegetable. Made for a salad. <laughs> True vegans have to take... No, I'm not going to do that. I can't. Do you understand... This is such a radical way of thinking. I want you to see what he's saying here. How I set this whole thing up. It, this is so different than what we're used to. Some of you guys, I lost you guys like a half hour ago. Because what I'm saying to you is absolutely ridiculous. You would never think so less of yourself and so high of somebody else. Listen, this is the... Here's where we finish. 
Turn to John chapter 6, please. This is the exact... John chapter 6, go all the way down to verse 48, 46, 48. John 6, 48. Everybody's there? Amen? Amen. I am the bread of life. Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which comes down from heaven, that one may eat of it and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. And the bread that I shall give is my flesh, which I shall give for the life of the world. The Jews therefore quarreled among themselves, saying, How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is food indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so he who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread which came down from heaven. Not as your fathers ate the manna and are dead. He who eats this bread will live forever. The Lord Jesus here, obviously, in case you don't know, is not talking, if you're Catholic background, is not talking about transubstantiation. He's not talking about cannibalism. He's using a spiritual metaphor to depict a very, very physical thing. He's saying, I am giving my flesh, I will die on the cross for my people. And they were kind of mocking at him, and he said, yeah. He says, you want, you want to be offended? I'll offend you. I'll make this whole thing spiritual. Unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no life. And they were like, huh? Yeah. The Father sent me, and if you don't eat my flesh and drink my blood, you're dead. And they were like, oh, that's disgusting. He goes, more? Your fathers ate manna in the wilderness and are dead. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has life. And they were like, that's it. The guy's nuts. He's off his rocker. This, right now, you're thinking and feeling, some of you guys are thinking and feeling the exact same way that the disciples who were listening to this thing are feeling. Listen, you got to die. You have to die. If you want to stay married, death is the only way. If you want to live a life of complete happiness, if you want to find a place where you like everybody, do you understand? Some of you people are so selfish, you hate everybody. You have no friends, you can get along with no people, every relationship you have must be this far away. Because you just don't like enough people. I just don't like people. I'm just not a people person. This is not the calling of a Christian. And yes, you can live your whole life like that. Yeah, you could even call yourself a Christian and be like that. But you will not be an effective servant of the Most High God. If you want to follow Christ, the idea is to love your brother, love your sister, to think of them better than yourself, to start to look at your life and say, yeah, the dude robbed me, but you know what? Maybe he's hurting. God God will replace it. Man, you know, that person said something to me, but, you know, the Bible says it's the glory of man to overlook a transgression. I'm cool with that verse. Yeah, but it also says to confront him. Yeah, but I'm going to choose this verse. I'm just going to let it go. I'm not going to act like it even bothers me because, you know what, it doesn't. You know what I've done against God? What do I hold against somebody else? Is Is this crazy talk to you guys? Is this insanity? You didn't read... Class of nutballs when you walked in, did you? But here I give you a new way. A new way of life that doesn't bring attention to yourself. That lets... We used to have this girl that used to come to church here named Rachel. Rachel lived at my house. She was one of my daughter's best friends. She lived at our house for like three years. Rachel was about the quietest human being I'd ever met. And we used to tell Rachel, 
squeaky wheel sometimes gets the oil. And you know what my wife said to her? Honey, God oils the wheels that don't squeak. She always does that stuff to me. <laughs> Listen to what the apostle said after he said this. These things he said in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Therefore, many of his disciples, when they heard this, they said, This is a hard saying. Who can understand it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples complained about this, he said to them, Does this offend you? What then if you should see the Son of Man ascend where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and their life. Guys, if you didn't stick around, like there's a few people who left, they didn't hear verse 64 and 63. He was talking spirit. Like, did the Catholic Church not read that whole thing? They still believe in the Catholic Church in transubstantiation, where it actually turns into the body and blood of Christ. It really, like there's this metaphysical thing. Now it's like, he's, he's, he's giving you spiritual words. But if you don't hang around, you know what? I don't like what that dude said. Well, why don't you hang around for a few months? Maybe you'll understand it. Maybe as you grow in the Lord, these deeper things you'll understand. Nah, I don't like that church. I want to go someplace where they have better music. Nah, I don't like that church. I want to go somewhere where the pastor doesn't yell all the time. Nah, I don't like that church. They don't have good parking there. Yeah, there's other church that has a restaurant and a bookstore. Uh, I don't like that. You know, whatever it is. You know, the words that I speak to you, they're spirit. But there are some who don't believe, 64, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were, who did not believe, and who would betray him. And he said, therefore I have said to you that no one could come to me unless it has been granted to him by the Father. Look at verse, ready? This is, this is I think, more than a little coinky dink The next verse I'm about to read to you, is chapter 6, verse 66. From that time, many of his disciples went back and walked with him no more. Chapter 6, verse 66. 666 says, From that time, many of his disciples walked with him no more. Then Jesus said to the twelve, Do you also want to go away? But Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Also, we have come to believe and know that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Close your Bible. Tough study, a lot to digest. You're in, you're in one of three places. Either you're too young mentally, and none of the things I said made any sense to you whatsoever. You shut me off a long time ago. Or you're in that middle ground, and you're like, you're, you're saying something that I don't like, and you're right, but I ain't got no time for it. Because you don't know what life I live. If I don't stand up for myself, I don't get nothing. You don't know what it's like being in my family. You don't know what it's like. You don't know. If you don't make a move, you don't get a move. If you don't shake the trees, nothing falls out of them. If you don't stand up for yourself, you get stepped on. And I ain't called to be no doormat. No, that's exactly what you're called to be, actually. But. And then there's you guys that are just like, dude... You know what you're saying right now? Increase our faith. God, increase our faith. I hear you. You're right. And this is hard, man. This is a hard saying. Who could know it? James McDonald, great preacher. One time he said, I was at a service that he taught, and he said, if people aren't walking away out of your church leaving and saying, this is a hard saying. Who could know it? then you don't have a ministry like Jesus Christ. I can roll with that. 
So, here you go. There's, you can add suck Bible study 577 to your <laughs> pocket, huh? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much for your word, and, um, and we don't thank you for your word all at the same time. Um, I feel like that same day that I stood at, the, at Tom's house, realizing that I had accomplished very little when I thought I accomplished much. God, I pray for my brothers and sisters that are here, that they receive death today and thus find life. God, I pray over my own heart, the heart of my family, and the heart of this congregation when I say, he who loses his life finds it. And he who finds his life loses it. God, I pray, save marriages, save young brothers and sisters. Take away from us selfishness and self-righteousness. God, take away from us this disdain we have for life itself. Remove from us fear of people knowing who we are. And, and God, open up the doors of heaven to receive us. We're so ready to go home. We pray with the Apostle Paul. Even so, come Lord Jesus. Amen. Amen.